Good morning and welcome to the second day of the HD Family Education Conference. We are so happy you were able to join us this morning. Today we will have a presentation from the HDSA Rocky Mountain Chapter detailing their organization and then we will hear from Donnie, Dr. Bonnie Hennig Trestman who is a licensed clinical social worker. We will end with a presentation from Dr. Bruce Compass, who unfortunately could not join us live today. However, his presentation is being shared courtesy of the HD Reach. If you have any questions throughout the presentations, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to type your questions. If you see a question already typed into the box that you are interested in hearing the answer to, you can give it a thumbs up to let us know there is a lot of interest in that question. Please feel free to type your questions throughout the presentations and we'll answer them at the conclusion of each presentation. This presentation is being recorded and we'd like to say thank you once again to Teva for sponsoring our event. Uh, we're gonna start today with a presentation from Megan Montsees um, and Megan serves as the vice president of the HDSA Rocky Mountain chapter. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start with her presentation. Thank you all for joining our annual education day today. My name is Megan Montsees. I am the vice president of the Huntington's Disease Society of America, Rocky Mountain chapter. Today, I'm gonna to talk with you about HDSA and how it is serving our HD community throughout the Colorado area. We have recorded this presentation to ensure all information is easily available to all of you. Afterwards, I will be available to answer any questions you might have live. If you have a question throughout, please include in the chat function. As mentioned, I'm the vice president of our chapter, but I'm joined by a full board of 12 dedicated volunteers to serve all of our efforts. You can see each of these individuals and their role on the slide shown. Each events, coordinating our support groups, and advocating for every, everyone impacted by HD. I'll talk more specifically about the efforts of HTSA Rocky Mountain Chapter in the coming slides. Overall, our goal is simple, to improve the lives of everyone affected by Huntington's disease. How do we do this? In a lot of different ways, which I'm gonna break down in the slides to come. To overall touch on what we do, um, I'll give a, a brief overview here, and then we'll go deeper into each of these topics throughout the presentation. So first, support. We support the Huntington Disease Society of America's mission to serve families through support groups, social workers, building community, and supporting our youth. We also build awareness with law enforcement, emergency responders, the medical community, employers, school personnel, and service organizations. We advocate for change at the community, regional, state, and federal level. We provide education for individuals, professionals, the medical community, caregivers, and school personnel. We raise funds in support of research and family services. We help participate in that research. And of course, we work to help keep hope alive for the HD community. The Rocky Mountain Chapter provides support through a staff social worker and resource line for the community. Many of you have met our social worker, Madeline Royal, through a support group. And if you haven't, um, we can find a way for you to get connected with her. I'll provide more information about contact 
at the end of this presentation. We also offer support groups across many of the cities across our state. However, note that with COVID, many of our regular support groups look a little different right now. Most of these groups are virtual and in many cases have been combined to offer more flexibility to join one that works for them. For the most, for the most current information about our support groups, which ones are active, which ones are upcoming, and the dates for all of these, be sure to visit rockymountain.htsa.org. Don't worry about remembering that right now. I have a slide about it at the end. Um, our hope is to be able to offer these individual support groups again in person, again when it's safe. So this information on the slide shows where when we do in-person support groups where you might be able to find one. Lastly, we also offer support by assisting and partnering with our local centers of excellence, which we'll talk about much more in a couple of slides. So how does HDSA Rocky Mountain Chapter build awareness? Our social worker does community outreach in medical facilities, long-term facilities, and law enforcement to educate these groups about HD. We also have worked with the National Youth Alliance to help get local youth to some of the retreats they sponsor. Also, HDSA Rocky Mountain speaks up and advocates for change for all of you. Both nationally with a spokesperson or lobbyists in Washington, and our national HDSA staff works to move the Parity Act forward with the help of local supporters. This bill waives for individuals diagnosed with Huntington's disease the 24 month waiting period for Medicare coverage. Current law generally applies this waiting period to individuals deemed eligible for old age survivors and disability insurance benefits. So between both local, um, regional and national efforts, we're working to make movement on the HD Parity Act. HD, HDSA also fights to protect those gains we've made in healthcare reform, um, for example, with pre-existing conditions, as well as health insurance and social security benefits. Next, HDSA Rocky Mountain um, works to educate. We do this through hosting Food for Thought educational events. We actually have one coming up virtually on November 5th on emotional intelligence. So make sure to look out at our website for more information about this, as well as our emails, which we'll share more information in the weeks to come. We also host these um, annual HD education days that we're currently participating in, um, in collaboration with the Centers of Excellence. Um, thank you all for attending this weekend, and hopefully you were able to make it last weekend as well, as there was lots of great information um, spoken about last weekend. And then we meet with schools, um, the medical community, and long-term care facilities to create consistent understanding and awareness of HD. Other ways we are raising funds include um, fundraising appeals, our Amarillo sale every year, which is actually coming up in about a month from now to purchase the Amaryllis that you see here on the screen. Um, they make great gifts. They're great for your own home. So look out if you're hoping to buy an Amaryllis this year. Um, those should come on sale in a couple of weeks from now. Additionally, through Amazon or smile.amazon.com, if you haven't added HDSA on Smile through Amazon, we encourage you to do so. This is a super easy way to automatically get a portion of your purchases donated to an organization of your choice from Amazon. So if you have HDSA added at smile.amazon.com, when you make any purchase through Amazon, they will donate a portion of the purchase to HDSA. And lastly, we also hold additional events from time to time throughout the year. Um, we're working on our 2021 calendar and some fun things that we'll be able to add in addition to the ones discussed. Now speaking about our Centers of Excellence. Um, the Centers of Excellence is one of the biggest efforts at HDSA where much of the testing and research happens for, um, for Huntington's disease. Denver is one of the only two areas with two centers of excellence. Um, these are the Movement Disorder Foundation, led by Dr. Kumar, 
and the University of Colorado led by Dr. Seeberger. Additionally, we have one of the first and only nonprofit centered excellence outside of a university with that Rocky Mountain Movement um, disorder with Dr. Kumar. Overall, we have one of the largest research efforts globally here in Colorado for Huntington's disease, which we're really proud to have the resources and offerings for our whole HD community to be able to um, get the support and care that they need and participate in a research study if they are qualified. So efforts with the Centers of Excellence that we do include um, monthly clinics for HD affected individuals to meet with an expert team. Um, they have lots of resources and people to speak with if you are someone who is currently affected or at risk for Huntington's disease. Additionally, if you are at risk, they do offer genetic, count genetic testing and counseling. And then additional educational opportunities through events like our annual education days um, that have happened this weekend and last weekend, as well as our food for thought presentation like we talked about earlier. Hopefully you all had a chance to hear from Dr. Kumar and Dr. Seeberger during the education day last weekend. If not, those presentations were recorded and will be shared out. So if you're registered, you will receive a link to these recordings. And I highly recommend you taking the time to watch these on some of the many really hopeful research opportunities being offered through both of our centers of excellences. And then as mentioned on the last slide, we have some of the largest research trial enrollment in the world, um, which is an awesome opportunity for anyone who really wants to help support this effort. They have opportunities for people who are positive, who are negative, who are at risk. So if this is something you're interested in, I highly recommend you get connected with one of these two centers um, to, to hear more about it. And then lastly, and one of the most important things the HDSA Rocky Mountain chapter does is keep hope alive. I hope you can all see through the support, education, and current research that we have so, so many reasons to be helpful, hopeful as a community. We have an ama amazing HD community all working together to improve the lives of everyone affected by Huntington disease. And all of you on this call today are definitely um, in that group of people who are working to keep hope alive. If you have any interest in getting involved with Rocky Mountain HDSA, um, please reach out to us. We're always looking for more great individuals to, to join our efforts, whether this be through attending, attending a fundraising or educational event, volunteering at one of our events, attending a support group, being an advocate for the cause, speaking to a group at an event, um, attending or adding new individuals to our board, um, and then always, you know, looking for charitable giving if you are able to do so. We encourage each of you to visit our website and follow up on social media to be kept up to date with everything going on with our chapter. You'll see the website listed here. This is where you'll also find information about our current events that I mentioned earlier. And then our Facebook page, we post lots of great content. Um, about things going on, about hopeful research, and all such things um, that we'd love to have you follow us on our Facebook page. And lastly, if you are interested in getting involved or have any questions at all, you can contact us through mail, phone, or email with the information currently displayed. Thank you all so much for your time and um, enjoy the rest of the session today and please reach out to us using this contact information with any questions at all that may come up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. That was wonderful. Uh, oh. I don't see that we have any questions in the question box right now. Um, I didn't know, Megan, do you wanna, do you have any, anything else to add to your presentation? Yes, um, thank you so much, Nicole. I'm just gonna expand on one thing. We had a, a small technical glitch for one of the slides that talked about additional fundraising events that I wanna touch on, knowing that it's a great way for people to come out and be involved with our community, be um, 
be able to, to celebrate all that we have to celebrate in HTSA and whatnot. So a big part of our fundraising is through our annual events. Um, many on, your, on the phone may have been to one of our events before. Our big annual events, um, in addition to some of the smaller ones I mentioned um, in our fundraising efforts, are our Celebration of Hope or Wine and Shine, for those who have heard it called that. Um, that was that happened in February of this year, um, but with COVID gathering restrictions right now, we're working to confirm a date for 2021 when we can hopefully do this in person together um, and celebrate all the great individuals in our HD community. In August, we also put on an annual golf tournament at Raccoon Creek called Fairways of Hope. Um, this was virtual this year in 2020, and we still had a great turnout for people who golfed on their own. But again, hopefully in 2021, we'll be able to gather together to do this in person. Um, and then in September each year, we do our Heroes and Villains 5K at Stapleton Park. Um, we just had our 16th annual one on September 12th, again, virtually, um, but hoping next year, this is a great event where we see so many of you in the HD community and hope, hope again that we can um, gather together. The Heroes and Villains um, link is still actually open on the website. So if you were looking to support a team or to donate to this cause, we still are collecting donations. Um, and again, you can use that contact information to reach out to any about these events if you're looking to get involved or just attend next year. Thank you. Um, still no questions in the Q&A box. Um, if you do think of any, please go ahead and type them into the question and answer box for Megan. Um, she will still be able to type an answer if we have time. We can always circle back to them. Um, thank you, Megan. Uh, I think we'll go on to the next presentation now. Um, Dr. Bonnie Henning Trestman has over 30 years of expertise providing and guiding clinical services to patients and family members suffering from neurodegenerative, physical, and psychiatric illnesses. She is the director uh, of the Caroleone Clinic Huntington. Oh, close. <laughs> Did I? Okay. <laughs> um, disease program in Roanoke, Virginia. She is the assistant professor at Virginia Tech. You want to, how is it? Carlin? Carillion. 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 Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> School of Medicine in the Department of Basic Science Education and the Special Programs Director at HD Reach in Raleigh, North Carolina. She has over two decades of experience working with people who are impacted by Huntington's disease. Uh, she is the president and owner of HTA Consulting PLLC, where she provides online teletherapy patients, uh, therapy to patients and their families in Connecticut, North Carolina, and Virginia. In 2018, Dr. Hennig Trestman was awarded a seed grant from the Huntington Study Group to research attitudes and obstacles parents perceive when discussing Huntington's disease with their children. In 2003, Dr. Hennig Trestman wrote a book called Talking to Kids About HD. It has been translated into multiple language and was revised in 2018. She has provided educational lectures to national and international audiences and is a member of the Huntington Study Group, the European HD Network, and serves on the board of directors as the research co-chair for the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization. Um, so we will let her take it from here. Thank you. And I just uh, a thumbs up, uh, Nicole. Uh, it's, it's all <laughs> it's a mouth, all mouthful. Um, can, and can you hear me OK? Just uh, OK, I so I get well. it. Yeah. I, I get a nod from Nicole. Well, thank you, first of all, um, to the, uh, the HDSA Center of Excellence at University of Colorado and the Movement Disorder Center for this invitation. It's, it's an honor always to, to take this opportunity to just talk to people, to reach out. And that's the silver lining in terms of COVID is that we can, meet, we can reach so many people. So you might not be sitting in Colorado, you might be anywhere in the world. And I think that that's, uh, this is a great opportunity. So thank you so much. I'm gonna be cognizant of time uh, because I know that uh, your time is precious as well. So I am gonna go through my slides uh, and give you a brief overview of what we're gonna discuss. So first of all, I do like to start with a, a quote. I like to start and end with quotes because I think it just sort of grounds me. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is mystery, but today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. I'm not 100% sure who said this. There's all kinds of uh, some guesses from people, 
But the reason I'm offering this is because I want you to think about this presentation as a gift. So for some of you, you'll open this and say, this is, this is exactly what you wanted and needed. And for other people, it's going to be, you're going to open it and say, you know, I, I don't think I need this. I don't think I want this. And you're going to put it in the back of the closet. And there's going to be other people who say, well, you know, maybe I don't need it right now, but this might be something I need in the future, or this might be something I can re-gift to somebody else. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I understand that not everybody is the same, not all families are the same, but many, there are many similarities between crises that, that families go with, uh, go through and chronic illnesses. So my hope today is to go over most of these topics of discussions, and I'll tell you why I say most. The first is the understanding and reasons for talking to kids about HD. The second is knowing the who, when, how, and what of talking to kids. We're going to learn about kids, uh, different um, uh, kids' emotions that they have. The, the caveat I have here is about learning about the different ages and stages. Just in terms of time, I've, I've removed that, that part, but I will give you a resource if you need to get more information regarding this. And we'll learn approaches of sharing information. So let's jump into this in terms of the reasons for talking to kids about Huntington's disease. Families affected by HD really do have additional stressors when there are kids involved. Many times parents and caregivers will say to me that you know, their, their knee-jerk reaction, which is absolutely understandable, is to hide this truth from, from children, that that's their way of protecting children. And I get that, I understand. But I also want to give feedback to say that when this happens, um, and it seems like at, at, the, at the beginning it's a good idea, in the long run it's actually detrimental because after 20 years, I'm actually talking to now these adults, young adults who have said to me, you know, I feel robbed. I feel like there was information about myself and my family that I didn't have. And even though I might've made the same decisions, the life decisions, all kinds of life decisions um, that I, I made today, I feel like I didn't have that information in front of me and it felt like it was mine. So I think it's really a good idea to, to talk about this. And children do know that there's something wrong by uh, not saying anything. They might have worse fears than actually what the, real, what the real situation is. They might, for instance, imagine that they did something to cause a family member to become ill. And so in turn, they developed anxiety and guilt. And by not talking about HD, it gives a message that it's just too terrible of a subject to, to be discussed. And if we normalize this and make this something and educate people, then we're empowering them. Children also might find that truth out from somebody else. This happens all the time. Over the two decades, I have multiple um, uh, people who have come back to me to say that you know sooner or later, so that my child found out the, the truth about something, you know about Huntington's disease that, that I didn't bring up with them. And children are learning more about genetics in terms of their schooling. Um, I have families who say that they receive propaganda in the mail and all of a sudden the child is looking through all this stuff that says Huntington's disease. And when I say child, it could be young adult. In fact, the United Nations uses the term um, young person as anyone 35 and, and younger. So we're talking about infancy all the way Way up to 35 when we talk about young people. And I worked with one family whose uh, father, the father had Huntington's disease and the mother, um, really I worked with her for many years to try to build up her, her confidence uh, to talk to her daughter about Huntington's disease. And she decided that she was going to go out and to do like a girl's night out with her daughter. And a couple days before she was actually going to go out, um, in biology class, the teacher was putting up, you know, genetic uh, uh, information about genetic illnesses on the chalkboard when they used chalkboard back then, um, and the and listed all these symptoms. And the, the child is sitting there going, you know, this house sounds familiar. This this looks familiar to me. And she went to her mother and said, you know, my teacher put up all this information about something called Huntington's disease. That dad has all of these things. Is this what's going on? And thankfully, the mother was strong enough and confident enough to kind of take a breath and say, yeah, you know, and this was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about when we went out. But, but you know, I'll talk to you about it right now and we can spend some time going out. But I, I want to let you know about this. It was just difficult for me to figure out how to do this, but I want to be open with you. So she was able to move forward and, and start, you know, at that point. But a lot of times, the children will find, young people will find out this truth from someone else. 
Also know that children who are informed can be a comfort to you. You're not, not going to feel like you have to spend all this time in, in remembering what you said to them and then sort of snowballing into what, what, you know, what did I tell them? Um, how can I cover all of this up? What about this medication that's, that's lying around uh, for the person who has Huntington's disease? What do I say to this child? Um, and I think that especially now with, even with social distancing, people are connecting, especially in families and they're talking. So it's really hard sometimes to, to hide all of this. And also please know that children have an amazing ability and capacity to deal with difficult situations because fears are learned. So when a baby sees a spider, a baby doesn't know that to be afraid of a spider or a snake, but when they see our reaction to it, then all of a sudden this is how that they, they learn to become fear, fearful. And so HD doesn't have to be fearful. And if the person with HD shows behaviors, which now has an explanation, children will learn that this is normal and they can continue to show affection and respect towards that person. So who should tell the kids? If you can, and this could be, I could be talking to you as a caregiver. Um, I could be talking to you as a person who is at risk. I can talk, be talking to you as somebody who is positive. Um, if you can, you should tell the kids about HD. If you feel like for whatever reason you can't, then maybe a close relative or a family member who has the correct information, not someone who's going to sugarcoat everything and not someone as I'll explain to you is going to just regurgitate all this information about HD. But I think it would be really helpful to have someone that the child trusts. You might not be in that situation. You might really not have anyone and not know how to do this or not feel comfortable doing this. And that's okay. You can certainly have a professional person, a staff, a healthcare provider who works with people with HD. Again, not somebody who is um, a healthcare provider who really doesn't know the facts about Huntington's disease. And you kind of say, you know, how could that happen? Well, you know, we get all kinds of stories saying my doctor, you know, knew, learned about Huntington's disease at med school or saw one person. So you really do want to connect with somebody and you have all these great resources as we just heard right in Denver. So there, there are definitely people who can help you. Um, again, the caveat in terms of this is that if you decide to have a professional do this, it can be really helpful to at least name what the child is going in to see this healthcare professional for, um, all the information a little bit ahead of time. So just being able to say, this is the place that mom or dad goes um, for, for their illness. And I wanna take you there. I wanna introduce you to someone who's going to talk to you a little bit more about this. So I think it can be really helpful because otherwise it can be really scary of where am I going? Who are all these strangers? Um, you know, what are they gonna be talking to me about? Cause that can be really scary when a child doesn't know. So when should you talk to your kids? Um, people make all kinds of arguments and I tell people at any and all ages, uh, the arguments are they're too young, uh, they're going to school, they're just starting high school, they're taking their exams, um, they're starting to date, they're uh, getting married, they're, she's pregnant, you know, all of these. And, and you can make excuses, but I think the right time is, is now. So obviously the younger the child is, the more basic the information can be. And certainly adolescence might be a time for, for more specific questions. People, you know, young people who are in their adolescence might have a lot of questions and I can answer some of those hopefully in this presentation. But the take home message is it's never too early but also know it's never too late. Inevitably, when I was doing these presentations live, somebody would come up to me and say, I did it wrong, um, I, I, I lied or I didn't tell the truth. And I say, it, it's okay, you did the best job you could with the information you had, but now here's your jumping off point. Now here's a place that you can say, I learned about Huntington's disease and I learned that it's really important for me to share this information. So don't feel like you did something wrong in the past, but let's see if we can move people forward who are still on, this, on the fence about talking to their children. And really important, you want to look at your own feelings about Huntington's disease. Your own feelings are going to be based on your own experience. So if you are one of these people who grew up in a house that didn't talk about Huntington's disease and this was all shut down and you had a lot of anger about that, my suggestion is to talk to somebody about all those feelings that you have first. Because the more you try to cover those up and hide those, it's going to come out in that discussion that you have with that child. Uh, with that young person. So I think it's really important to at least talk to, uh, think about your own feelings. 
And I want you to find a language that's comfortable to you, but I also want you to be careful because when you say something about, you know, daddy has a boo-boo in his head, and then all of a sudden the child is out in the playground, falls down, and someone says you have a boo-boo, all of a sudden, does that mean that I'm going to have what dad has? And so I think it really is helpful. Huntington's disease is, is a long word, um, but saying HD, that there's an illness that we call the short version is HD, um, I think could be really helpful. So using correct language, I think is, is best. And you might need to talk to different age children separately. My take on this is that I think it's really important that if you have one, two, seven, and the, I think the most, uh, the biggest family I had was 15 children, um, is that you, you say that you give everyone basic information all together. That way the family knows that everybody in the family is at the same level and knows this information. I do have many families who come to me and say, well, I'm gonna tell this child, but not that child. That puts a huge burden on the child that you have told. Sometimes that child will immediately go to the other children to say, this is what's going on. Sometimes they feel like they have to hold on to this. And, and that's a huge burden to place on, on a young person. So I really do think that everyone should have the basic information. And then obviously with different ages, you can uh, give more specific information. And role play, practice what you say and anticipate those tough questions. Those tough questions are, you know, whoever has HD, are, are they going to die? Um, you know, you, mom, dad, are you going to get this? So I think having, uh, having answers ahead of time and talking to healthcare professionals about some of these answers can be really helpful and prepare you. And find a comfortable and familiar place to talk to your kids. Maybe you have those discussions when you're doing the dishes or taking a walk or during a drive. Um, I think that it's really helpful to, to be in a place that you feel most comfortable so that you can, uh, you can talk to your children the way that you normally do and you feel that it's a good place to do that. So I'm gonna break down, these are just topics I'm gonna to break this down of telling children information they can understand, listening to them, telling them about how you feel, beware of what I call the don'ts and some ways to talk to kids. But I want you to know that truly the experience of talking to children about HD is less distress, distressing than the anticipation leading up to it. And, and that's a big sentence and what do I mean? And I'll give you an example. Um, I'm also a proponent of advanced directives or living wills. And I think that it's really important for families to talk about this. Um, and obviously, if I think it's really important for families to do that, I needed to do that. And I know that when I filled out my own advanced directives and, and brought that into, you know, I used a, a, an attorney, um, the people can use power of attorney, can do all kinds of things or just have a discussion. When I went into that office to, to sign my name, you know, I was sure that when I walked out and crossed the street that I was going to get hit by a truck because I was I had this anticipation it, it's not a comfortable thing to do but after that day when came and went and this was you know 30 something years ago 40 something years ago that I knew that it, it was that I, I was anticipating that I was worried about it uh, versus just doing this and, and getting this done with and it, it wasn't as bad as I actually thought it would be okay so let's talk about Telling, telling children information they can understand. I always tell people it's kind of like feeding, in, feeding food to a baby. You're not gonna make a whole steak and potatoes dinner for a baby. You're going to feed them a tiny bit of baby mush on a tiny little spoon and see if they can swallow it and, and, and digest it. That's the same thing. You wanna gradually share bits of information. You don't have to go into a, a whole dissertation, but you do need to know that you have to go back to this. It's not just, hey, this is about HD and you run the other way or hand them a book or a pamphlet. Also leave them with a feeling of hope. This is something I do in my clinic all the time, whether I'm talking to someone with teletherapy, whether I have somebody in, in one of my offices, I always want to leave people with a feeling of hope because that's true. Right now, as you'll hear through, I, it sounds like from last week, some of the, um, uh, the research information, the updates about what's, what's happening even in your area, certainly with some of the bigger conferences that are coming up with EHDN and HSG, um, that we're gonna hear lots of information about clinical trials that are happening and there's some really good information. So I always tell people to be hopeful. Right now, even through COVID, a lot of these centers and clinical trials are still full force. So we will have information uh, to help and, and to hopefully treat and maybe even cure HD. That's, that's certainly the hope. And tell children that they'll always be loved and cared for. It's really important for people to feel that even through all of this, um, you might not have all the answers, which I'll talk about as well, but that there's going to be somebody who's going to love and care for them. 
and listen to them. Answer a question simply. You don't have to go into CAG repeats and all kinds of, of details about Huntington's disease. Ask them also after you're done talking what they think HD is. I do this with adults all the time because that gives me a chance to correct any misinformation. And I do get, even from adults, a lot of misinformation about Huntington's disease. So that gives me a chance to, to correct all of that. Ask them if they're worried about you, the family member. And a lot of times know that children or young adults are gonna say, I'm not worried. That, that's fine. You can certainly say, I'm glad that you're not worried. I want to let you know that there are certainly times that I'm worried. And although I can't make that go away, we can kind of be worried together and we can talk about things. So maybe some of the things that you are worried about, I might be able to let you know that I'm concerned about that too. Or we can go talk to someone. And look for nonverbal cues to see if your child has had enough. We all know that glazed over look that just says, you know, they're thinking about getting onto Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, or something else. So just know that, you know, you know your child best, or, you know, that uh, if it's not your child, the child that you are a caregiver of, that you know this, this child best, and you know when they've had enough. So that's also giving them information gr uh, gradually. So when that does happen, stop, but do let them know that you, you plan to come back to discuss this at another time. And be aware of the don'ts. Don't lie. Lying takes up so much energy and it breaks trust. Um, I think that that's a really big take home message that I have. And don't overburden children with a lot of medical details. Uh, if they're asking a question, answer it. But then you can say at the end, did that answer your question? And um, you'll know if you've seen me live, uh, talk, talking live, and if you, you know, maybe even on the question and answer, after I do get some of the questions, I automatically, I'm not even thinking about it, I do say, does that answer, or you know, did that answer your question? Because I might be totally off the mark, and I want to know that if you ask me a question, that I'm on the right path and, you, and getting, giving you the answer that, that perhaps, you know, that you were looking for. Also, don't trouble children with financial, financial concerns unless it impacts them directly, like there's a lifestyle change. Um, you know, again, the days that kids were going to school and being part of um, you know, different sports, sometimes it might be that because of financial issues that you know, people need to pull back a little bit. Um, let them know that, that that is not their fault, um, but see maybe that there are scholarships, maybe that the town or the schools can help out. Um, so be creative in terms of some of these things, but don't overburden children because they, they will take that very seriously. Please, please, please do not make promises that, that you can't keep. That can include, no, you're never going to get Huntington's disease if you really don't know the status of the child, if they're still at risk. Or I promise I will never put mom, dad, grandma in a nursing home because you just don't know what's going to happen in the future. What happens if you're compromised and all of a sudden you become resentful um, that, that you've made these promises. So I think it's really important to know that um, you, know, you can say, my next bullet point, you could say, I don't know. And I don't know means two things. I don't know, but maybe somebody else does and we can find the answer. And I don't know also means like, I don't know, but maybe you know, we will we'll have to wait and we'll wait on this together to find out in the future. And again, don't push kids to talk. I get a lot of families who feel like the holy grail is dragging a young person into my office and saying, fix them. You know, let them know, let them know what's going on. Um, that, that's a hard one because I don't have the holy grail. I can, I can empower, I can provide tools, but know that with a child, you can say, I gave you a lot of information and I know that your friends can be a support to you, but not a lot of people know about HD. So if you do have questions and if you don't wanna ask me, I can, I can you know, let you talk to somebody who is an HD expert, even without me, um, me there. So I think that that's a, a gift that you can give to your children as well. And so ways to say things, and I'm oversimplifying and I get that, but sometimes it is about just being simple. Saying that mom or dad has an illness and it's called Huntington's disease or HD. And sometimes it makes mom, dad do things that aren't always normal and you can talk about those. Also sometimes drawing a family tree or talking to kids about the family members who either have Huntington's disease or at risk. So you don't have to always talk about right away that at risk status, but then at least the child will be able to understand and ask questions. And sometimes the children actually notice things that you haven't noticed about people um, in, in the family who, who, have, who are experiencing Huntington's disease or symptoms of. So I think it's a good way to at least start the conversation. And know that there are um, uncertainties and, and unknowns. 
uh, when dealing with Huntington's disease. We, we do that as adults as well, that there's just days that you just don't know and you hang on for that roller coaster ride and know that there are some questions you're not gonna be able to answer and accept this. And if, when you accept this, you are teaching your children to be able to accept this fact also. And find out as much as you can to make the unknown more familiar. Knowledge is power. And I think that that's really helpful because sometimes we have these fears that are very different than the truth. So a family that I worked with where um, the daughter saw that all the women in the family, you know, her mother, her aunt, her grandmother all had Huntington's disease. And she just made this assumption that, you know, this is what's going to happen to her as a female. And when she was given this information, this knowledge to say, actually, you're 50% at risk, just like your brother, it gave her a little bit of hope because she just assumed that this was what was going to happen. And in terms of tips to deal with changes, let children know gradually that there's gonna be changes in what the person with HD uh, will be able to do. An example of that is driving. You're not gonna to say to a child um, about a parent who is newly diagnosed or even before that has, has the uh, HD gene, that found out about the HD gene, which we know is different than actually being diagnosed, um, is that you know, uh, dad's not gonna be able to drive. You know, that might not happen for, for years and years. So you wanna actually prepare children close to the, the time so if there's, a, for example, a, a parent who's uh, going to be going out on disability, there's a long time between starting to file that, that paperwork for disability and them stopping working and, and actually becoming what we call disabled. So it's not about talking to the children well in advance. It's about saying, you're going to see dad at home a little bit more, and this is what's going on, and giving them this information gradually. Try to keep routine, the household routines as normal as possible without denying illness. If a person can't drive, you don't want them driving your children around. Um, but if you, if you can have that person with HD who maybe will be home and not going to work anymore, um, maybe they can help out in the morning or maybe if that's too much overstimulation, as soon as they leave, as soon as everyone leaves, the way we used to in the past, um, that maybe they can start cleaning up or, or doing, you know, packing a lunch the night before, something to keep a structure. And please know that it is not a, a weakness to ask for help. I worked with a family that was absolutely adamant with their two children to not tell anyone in their community about what was going on. And these kids were, were sports kids and they played soccer and they were doing all kinds of stuff and everything stopped for them and, and there was no explanation. Um, and the kids just didn't know how to cope because they didn't have an outlet. And they got into some bad groups of, of, of behavior, they get into bad behavior and groups of people that were influencing this bad behavior. Again, they just didn't know how to cope. And we went from not telling every, anybody to actually I did a town hall meeting um, with over 150 people where I talked about Huntington's disease because they became so desperate and not knowing how they were going to get through uh, their crisis. And letting people know that, that dad had Huntington's disease and what was going on. And, and it took a village, but this village came together to offer support. And the one thing that this family didn't want to, to do is to be judged or to be pitied. And this community helped them. So I think it's really important to ask for help and be flexible when necessary. We know sometimes that people with HD do have some impulsivity and they do have some explosive behavior. So know that if there is something going on, for example, like a movie night that um, I had a family, again, this is all pre-COVID, so I apologize, who was going out to the movies, um, that they were, uh, the two children were um, allowed to bring a friend, but when push came to shove, the mom who had HD had a, had a tantrum and, and you know, just made it difficult for, to be left alone uh, or uh, certainly to go along with them to the, to the movies. So the dad, you know, who, who explained to the children about Huntington's disease well in advance and allowed them to have a friend come over and the friends knew about Huntington's disease. They said, you know, this is one of those HD nights. And unfortunately our plans will change a little bit, but we're going to put on some Netflix and we're going to make some popcorn and we're sending mom to her room right now. We're saying, you know, you need to calm down and we need to have you someplace safe. So we need to be here. Um, and they, he made it, he made it flexible and he knew that there was, um, there there was a possibility. So I think you trying to be flexible when necessary is really important. And also having that emergency plan in place. So maybe movie night is not an emergency, but I had a family who was going to a, a big affair out of state and the, uh, everyone was invited, everyone was excited to go. And the, the mother, the wife knew that her husband might um, balk at the last minute. He might, he might have a tantrum. And so she called a friend and said, listen, this is when we're supposed to be gone this weekend. And you know about my husband, you know about Huntington's disease. Can you keep this weekend free? And he said, sure. 
And sure enough, when push, push came to shove on that Friday night when they were packing up their van and getting ready, the person with HD had a meltdown. And, you know, everyone kept packing up the van. And so the wife said, you know, you can do your thing. If you're not coming with us, it's not stopping us from going. And, and your buddy Charlie is coming over. Um, and, and that was an issue. But Charlie showed up. The person calmed down. The family was sad that, that dad didn't go with them. But that was the emergency plan. And as sad as it was, they were able to have joy and, and go to this affair. So I think having emergency plans can be really helpful. So again, in terms of the different ages and stages, again, I'm just cognizant of time. So I want to let you know that, um, the, that this, the, this presentation is in the book that Nicole was talking about. And if you do go onto Amazon Kindle and you want to download that, you do not need a Kindle to do that. Um, you can read a little bit more about ages and stages. Please know that um, the book is much less than it was in hardcover, but all the proceeds go to uh, organizations like HDEO. Um, it goes to a good cause. Feel free to that up if need be. So I think it's really important to know that if you don't show how you feel, then a child is, I describe it as a tea kettle, that if that tea kettle starts to boil and if it builds enough pressure, it's going to blow up. Um, and that's the same thing for feelings. If you teach a child to show their and reactions, then a child is going to learn to do that as well. Um, so I think when this, when, when you accept and you don't have to be frightened of your own feelings, then a child's going to be able to accept that as well. So sometimes there are different feelings and reactions that kids have. So you might have that kid that feels sorry for themselves all the time. Why is this happening to me? Um, kids might feel angry at the affected person for, um, for being sick. They might feel angry at the disease, but then take it out on the well parent. They might try to become super kid and set unrealistic high goals for themselves in school or sports or something. Kids might feel scared and be fearful that something's going to happen to the sick person um, when they're not there. So they might want to be with that person all the time. They might withdraw in order to become dependent in case something happens to the parent. You know, it, I have these young kids at seven and eight who just want to be able to fend for themselves in case or don't want to get close to somebody because they might lose that person. They might resent the fact that they need to take care of the affected person. We do unfortunately have a lot of young people, even in their teens, um, whose jobs it is to, to take care of the loved one with Huntington's disease. They might make jokes about everything to cover up their real feelings about HD. And some children will act out to get attention or they'll fake being ill to stay at home with affected parents. Obviously know that the kids get sick. They get sick all the time. Uh, we're trying to keep everybody helpful, healthy right now. But continual headaches and stomach aches are a child's way of saying, need a little help over here. I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling overwhelmed, but they can't say that. So what happens is that their body is telling us that if they are continually with that stomach ache that has no real root, real cause, um, or the headaches or want to be home with a person with HD, then, then we need to make sure that that, that child gets some professional help um, and, and, and has that addressed. So now what do you do when kids have all of these emotions? And I think it's really important to continue. It's very important to set limits, to set firm limits with children. It's certainly normal to see some acting out when there are changes in the family and communicate with your children your acceptance of them, but not their behaviors. Reward good behavior and let them know how much you appreciate their help and also set limits with the internet. I know that that, especially now during COVID is really difficult. And I mentioned really briefly uh, one great site uh, called H. Huntington's Disease Youth Organization. And I think there is a, mis a misnomer in terms of, of what HDO does that sometimes people feel that this is a, a site that only um, families where there are is, is juvenile Huntington's disease. And that's certainly not the case. We consider people who have HD or are at risk affected by Huntington's disease, but everyone around that person is impacted by Huntington's disease. So even at our camps, um, which we do with in collaboration, we did in collaboration with uh, the NYA as well, I know that that was discussed, is that we have people who are at risk, young people who are at risk, some because it's a camp for ages like 15 to 22, some have been tested positive, some have been tested negative. 
Um, some are um, people who aren't at risk at all. We had one young, uh, young woman who really wanted her significant other, her boyfriend to come with her because he wanted to understand uh, with her being at risk what this was all about. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it is just for people who have or might have this gene. It is for anyone impacted by Huntington's disease, stepchildren, cousins, families, friends. So I think it's really important to find good sites that can help people. And sharing, really important to think about doing things together as a family. Again, if that's your thing, if you're a family that it's toxic, maybe that's not your thing. But I think it's important that you find friends and families um, and you do things together. And, and laugh. Laughter is the best medicine and it's okay to laugh. Make up inspirational slogans together and post them around your house. I have one family who the mother's um, slogan was, I've got a lot of living left to do. And that was inspirational to her. It was, you know, and, and mirrors in different places so that they can share this information. And share stories and uplifting experiences. When you create a positive memories, you teach your children that it's okay to have fun, even in the midst of something that, that's not so good. And it allows children to know that they can um, that they can go and they can have fun and they can do things because otherwise the, uh, the opposite is that you're, you're sitting at home and you're um, depressed and, and not um, you know, really being able to experience life. So you didn't, as a parent, you did not give um, your adult child Huntington's disease on purpose. Uh, this is not something we give to each other. This is something that happens in our genes. So it's, it can be helpful to talk to a healthcare professional about taking that onus off and saying, how do I continue to live and live positively with Huntington's disease. On my first year of giving this, this talk, I had a child stand up and, and a young person stand up and said that she really appreciated this talk. It was very interesting because I didn't expect young people to be at one of these first talks that I gave, um, but it was validating. And she said, you know, I have a family that we talked about Huntington's disease. And she gave me, she told the story that she had a, a friend when she was very young in, in um, grade school that was in a wheelchair and that people really didn't talk to this, this young woman so much, um, but she decided to go over and to talk to this person and become with this person. And I think because she had this open uh, and honest relationship at, at home with somebody who might be different, that it opened her eyes and it was the silver lining, what I call the silver lining to HD, that she was able to say, you know, I can go over and even though she might be different, this young girl in the wheelchair might be different, that, you know, I can be friends with her and I can show her love and compassion and she's fine. So I think that there is a little bit of a silver lining and it's that children can grow in their abilities to face difficult experiences. They can become more self-confident and independent. They can become more responsible. They might, as I said, become more sensitive to other people's needs and they might grow in their ability to understand and love another person, even if that person is different. So in terms of resources, I think that know that you are not alone, that I think it's really important to reach out, whether you are a parent, caregiver, young person yourself, um, certainly, I have my book talking to kids about Huntington's disease. HDO.org is a wonderful website written for young people um, and, and created by young people for young people. Uh, as we heard, HDSA.org has the, and the National Youth Alliance that works closely with uh, HDO as well. There's a whole publication list of resources. And if you are somebody who is, is uh, in Canada, the Huntington's Disease so uh, Society of Canada has YPAD, which is very similar to NYA. And a lot of times we do um, kind of joint uh, uh, excursions, you know, joint um, uh, kinds of experiences, such as the, uh, the camps that we used to do uh, from the N uh, HDO. So I, I think I'm hoping that I provided you with information um, and that you can take these tools and feel a little bit more confident. Um, this is somebody you might know, uh, Marjorie Guthrie, um, who wrote, the more we feel at home with our fears, the easier it is to accept the reality of what is or what will be. I think really sums up all of this, that these, these conversations can be fearful and, and you can worry about them and you can anticipate the worst. But I can tell you in 20 years of working with young people and families, that when I'm done with talks and when I go to uh, work with young people at talks or at the camps that, I'm a staff, that I was a staff member at, the HDO camps, when I say, what is the message you want me to take back to your families? Their message is very clear. Please tell them to talk to us. Tell them that we are resilient. 
tell them that we'll be okay. We have resources, we have friends, we have people in the HD community that we can rely on, but we need them to be open and honest with us. That comes from their mouths. And I think that if you're able to take away even just a little bit from this, um, I, I'm hoping that it will be tools that you can keep in your toolbox and go back to as needed. So thank you so much for all your time. Um, and I think I'm gonna have Nicole or whoever it is going to help in terms of um, the chat room and, and uh, asking questions. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat box right now, but I do see a raised hand. Okay. Um, let's see. I'll let you do all that. <laughs> Uh, uh, Joanne has a question. She has her hand raised. So Joanne, you should be able to unmute yourself now if you want to ask your question. Joanne's still on mute. Yep. Joanne, can you find the unmute button and unmute yourself? It should be on the bottom left. And we can't unmute her, right? I can. I've asked, okay. I've sent like a little pop up to her. Okay. Any other questions? I'm no, I think seeing... she's still having difficulty. Well, please do know that um, Nicole can get in touch with me, um, even if you just Google my name. Um, I do go by Dr. Bonnie because my last name is a little bit of a mouthful as we were talking um, before the presentation. Um, so I, I think that, you know, you, you can certainly find me um, in either through HDO, through HD Reach, um, through Carilion Clinic. Uh, I am available. It looks like there's one. No, just a comment. Well, thank you for that comment. Uh, someone had a nice comment. All right. Oh, someone said, no, no question. I wish I would have had this earlier. Agreed, um, you know, and I understand that. Um, but, but know that you can, as I said, use this as a, a jumping off point. So just even if you've talked to your children, go back and just say, you know, I was on this webinar and, and this is your, this is your, your you know, I'm, I'm giving you this as a gift. This is a gift to be able to say, do you have any questions about HD? Do you have anything that you're worried about? You can still go forward, uh, even if you're a children or adult children, just to say, I'm just checking in uh, in terms of, of, you know, do you have any, any questions or concerns? Even if they're adult children, even talk talking about future generations. Have you thought about future generations? Have you thought about planning for future generations? I think that those are all things that you can continue to have, um, have discussions with young people and we'll use even above 35. Wonderful. All right, still not seeing anything else. Um, yes, please feel free if you guys need to get in touch. Um, our email at the Movement Disorder Center is just movement at ucdenver.edu, um, or you can find all of that information on our website to cumovement.org. Um, so please feel free to reach out. Um, otherwise, I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much for that. That Thank was you, wonderful. Everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Compass is unavailable to join us live this morning. Um, this presentation is brought to us in partnership with the HD Reach. HD Reach is here to help families with Huntington's disease, and you can find them at www.hdreach.org to learn more about the symptoms and treatments for HD. And you are invited to join them for their 2020 HD Education Conference, um, and I can send this link out as well. Their address for that co conference is conference.hdreach.org to get the most recent updates on the future of HD reach and treatment and a variety of talks geared to help everyone in the family system that is impacted by HD. Dr. Compass keynoted their conference with a fantastic talk on developing resiliency to help cope with adversity and participated in their Ask the 
experts panel. He is a professor of pediatrics at Vanderbilt University, and we will go ahead and go into his presentation now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bruce Compass, and I'm a professor of psychology and pediatrics at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and I am pleased to be a part of the HD Reach, Your Road to Wellness and Re Resilience meeting. Uh, to be fully honest, this is my first Zoom meeting presentation where I'm recording myself. Uh, this is, I think, my fourth try to see if I can get this thing to work and make it right. So hopefully we'll get through this and sail through smoothly. So I'm pleased to be here. I'm sad that we can't all be together in person, uh, but I'm glad to be able to contribute from a distance. So the title of my talk today is Families Coping with Illness, Implications for Huntington's Disease. Uh, I disclosed before any talks that the research I'm going to tell you about is supported by funds from the in branches of the National Institutes of Health and by private foundations. Um, my research team and I have been doing this work for a long time, several decades, and we have worked with families uh, faced with a number of different kinds of um, physical illness and psychiatric problems. And that's included families in which a mom or a dad has cancer, families where a child has cancer, families struggling with Huntington's, excuse me, with sickle cell disease, with hemophilia, with congenital heart disease, and most recently, we've shifted our focus to include of families in which a parent has Huntington's disease. So in addition to making the list, um, at this point in the work that we do, Huntington's disease has headed to the top of the list. It's become the most compelling and most important part of the work that we do. Uh, it didn't take us long to understand that the challenges faced by families in which somebody uh, has Huntington's uh, are significant in terms of the stress that they're faced with. So. Uh, and, and simply put, we're all in on trying to understand and do things to help families faced with Huntington's disease. Throughout all the work that we've done, one thing that's been uh, abundantly clear is that life isn't fair. Life's not a level playing field. Some families are faced with greater stress and more adversity than others, and families who struggle with chronic illnesses go on that list of more, more stress, more adversity than families who somehow have been spared those kinds of problems. Um, within that, there's huge variability. Some families and faced with significant stress and adversity uh, seem to maintain their health, mental health, physical health, and even seem to thrive. And those families we would refer to as resilient, whereas other families struggle more. Uh, they have a tougher go of it. And those families uh, end up with more problems and struggle more, and we would say they're vulnerable. And a question that uh, goes through all of the work that we do, no matter who we're working with, cancer, uh, heart disease, et cetera, uh, is how can we build resilience in those who seem to be vulnerable? When we do this, we go through a series of steps each time uh, to be systematic, to collect information, to learn, uh, let families teach us about what they're going through in order for us to use that information in a way that would be helpful. So the first thing we do is identify sources of stress for children and families faced with a particular problem, and I'll focus on what we've been learning from families uh, faced with Huntington's disease. Then we identify psychological, neurocognitive, or brain processes, and interpersonal or communication processes that seem to characterize families who are resilient. Then we ask those same questions to identify what is it about psychological, neurocognitive, communication, interpersonal processes among those families that are more vulnerable. And we then develop programs to support vulnerable children and families and try to help build resilience in them. So as we've gone through all of our work, we've been asking ourselves what's similar in Huntington's to other groups of families that we've worked with and what's different, what's unique about Huntington's. So before I tell you about some of the research, let me tell you some things that um, young adults and adolescents whose parents have Huntington's have shared with us. Uh, this was some of what I first learned when I started this work about a year and a half ago. And to be honest, it's what drew me in and it's what's kept me here. So a couple of comments that seem to characterize the resilience part of it. Someone shared with us that it's changed the way we have to do things, but it's brought us closer together as a family. And that struck me because uh, 20 years ago when we did work where mom or dad was diagnosed with cancer, most of those families said we hate cancer, we hate that it's a part of our lives, but it did bring us together closer. And that seems to characterize some families in Huntington's. It pulls us together uh, as we try to battle uh, Huntington's. 
Another said, we still struggle deeply as a family, and I don't think I'll ever be able to say I had a happy childhood. Despite this, we're coming through this together as my mom's sickness begins to come to a close, and I'm grateful for the healing that I'm beginning to feel. Others, though, shared things about their vulnerability and the toll that Huntington's was taking on them and their families. One saying, currently, one of my biggest challenges is my mental health. I honestly don't know what to do about it. I can't afford a therapist, and I don't have anyone to talk to about all my stress and anxiety. My family is not someone I can openly share my feelings with. The second said, the biggest challenge I face with HD is thinking about my future. I find myself going weeks in denial and blacking it out, and then weeks where it consumes me and I can't get out of bed. I envy just about anything and everyone that does not have this illness consuming their life. And last, and most difficult, I am nothing but terrified of HD. I live in fear that HD made me less than human to the rest of the world. I didn't want to have dreams or continue the things that I'm passionate about. I was so hopeless that by the time I was 15, I wanted to commit suicide. So those three individuals, uh, to me, are the examples of how we want to help folks who are struggling with this experience with Huntington's uh, to build resilience and get through this as strongly as they can. So what I'll tell you about as quickly as I can today is stress and how stress has different effects on um, mental health, direct effects on mental health and physical health. And we'll talk about the stress of Huntington's disease. Uh, that one of the ways it affects us, all of us, is that stress affects our brain development and our brain function. It has an impact on executive functions, which are complex thinking skills that develop in a particular part of our brain that I'll explain. Uh, and Huntington's, in fact, also affects those same brain regions that are adversely affected by stress, kind of a double hit. Executive function skills, complex thinking skills, are the very things we need to effectively cope with stress. So as stress increases, uh, it has a nasty effect of making it harder to do the things that we need to cope with stress. In addition, we don't cope all by ourselves. A lot of effective coping involves support and communication with others, and I'll talk about that and that caring for others and being cared for by others has benefits and it has costs. So when I care deeply for other people, I benefit from that. That has beneficial effects for me, but it also can come with a cost, particularly if I'm 14 or 15 and taking on responsibilities that might be things that are a better fit for somebody who is maybe 10 or 20 years older than I am. We take all that information then, lastly, and how all those processes can be improved through psychological and behavioral programs to try to build resilience. So starting with stress, it includes both things that happen and how we think about them. Uh, someone may have said to you at some point, and I've certainly heard it said, that, well, stress is all in your head. It's all in how you think about it. And that's not true. Stress is both what happens in our lives and how we think about it. So some circumstances are almost universally stressful for everybody who goes through them. But many events, there's huge differences. Some people seem to take a big hit and other people seem to fare um, much better. And part of that is in how we think about the events that occur, and I'll talk to you about that. So stress is both what happens to us and how we think about it. Uh, stress then comes in different sizes and shapes, uh, and it ranges from traumatic events uh, that are sudden, typically beyond normal limits, and Hearing that day when you heard you were diagnosed with Huntington's disease uh, can be experienced by folks as a highly traumatic experience. Uh, you can define the time, the place, uh, literally down to the hour, who was there, who told me when I got the results of that diagnosis. Pretty overwhelming. There are other events that are big, but not quite as big as a traumatic event. So for many, uh, parents going through divorce would be an example of a major life event, not necessarily traumatic, but nonetheless a major stressor in their lives. Minor events are smaller, and those are the kinds of things that someone might define as sort of the hassles and that characterize everyday life. No big deal. Uh, but it turns out that minor events are important. So arguments with others, uh, some of the chronic recurring things that happen with uh, having to go to medical appointments or take somebody that I'm taking care of to their medical appointments, each time they happen, no big deal. They happen again and again and again, and they start to take a toll. In fact, chronic events, even when they're small, may take a bigger toll on us than the big events that happen less often. And then finally, chronic adversity is a different kind of stress. They're not necessarily events involved. It's conditions that we live under. The most powerful one I can think of is financial hardship and poverty, uh, but also living with and living with someone who has a chronic illness is an adversity, not necessarily events, but just a condition that doesn't seem to go away. So when we started this work, one of the things we had to do was try to identify sources of stress for Huntington's disease patients and their families. So for patients, 
stressors include beginning to have troubles with my thinking skills. So I know that I'm having trouble remembering things. I'm having problems making decisions and I'm aware of that and that's a source of stress for me. Uh, accompanying that can often be a loss of work and independence. So I can't hold my job anymore because my physical and cognitive skills don't allow me to do that. And if I can't work now, I'm becoming more dependent on other people, less independent myself. Maybe I'm not able to drive anymore. That's a major stressor. Uh, trouble managing my emotions. So for some folks with Huntington's, it gets harder and harder to manage anger and sadness uh, and other emotions that occur. The physical symptoms, the motor symptoms, the chorea that characterizes Huntington's can be a major source of stress. And for some folks with Huntington's, their world starts to shrink as they become more impaired physically and more impaired and, and uh, difficulties cognitively, the world gets smaller. They can't move around as much. They can't get around as much. They can't attend events that they used to. They lose contact with friends and loved ones and the world gets smaller. For family members, it can include uh, seeing the effects of HD on a parent or a, a spouse, a husband or a wife, and seeing that in another person is extraordinarily difficult and stressful. Uh, increased responsibility to care for a family member with HD is something we learned early on was a source of stress for family members. It makes good sense, and I'm sure for many of you, you know uh, what that's like. Fear that I might have HD or develop HD, so that's a pervasive concern among children of adolescent age, young adult age, offspring. Um, arguments or conflicts that arise within the family, and then struggling to make decisions about genetic testing. Do I want to be tested? Uh, do I not want to be tested? Those are major decisions and struggles and, and significant sources of stress. So I mentioned that it comes in different shapes and sizes and big events often then lead to chronic stress. So in this picture, you see how something hits the surface of the water and it ripples out. And that place where it hit, that's a big deal. But those ripples are the things we often need to pay attention to. So events happen that then lead to chronic stressors, smaller ones when they occur, but it's the chronicity and those ripples that emanate out that are important. So what does stress do? It has effects on physical health, but stress does not make you sick. Okay? Stress makes it more likely that other things will make you sick. So what happens is stress um, undermines the body's ability uh, to ward off uh, other kinds of things that are going to cause me physical illness. And that includes viruses, which is pretty current and topical right now, my body's ability to fight off a virus, and bacteria. So what happens is that stress alters our immune function in important ways that makes us more vulnerable to things that could make us sick. Stress is also the single most important factor in putting us at risk for mental health problems. If I had only one thing to choose that might lead to problems like depression and anxiety, the biggest predictor of those kinds of problems is stress. So it increases risk for stress, for depression, for anxiety, for post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders, substance use disorders, all of those. And through all of it, we know that the effects of stress differ from one person to the next. Uh, under this are the physical responses to stress, and I want to mention them because if we're talking about a physical illness, Huntington's disease, we have to understand what stress is doing to us physically. Uh, our bodies uh, produce hormones when we respond to stress. So we have a, a picture on the left side of the slide there of uh, one of the cascades that occurs in your body when you're stressed. And one of the things it does is produce a hormone. We produce a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is both your friend and your enemy. I believe that would make it a frenemy. And uh, cortisol benefits us in many ways and harms us in other ways. Uh, our body produces cortisol in a natural pattern that's shown in the graph on the right, where it's highest in the morning when we wake up. Our body's producing high levels of cortisol. It slopes down during the day. It's sort of a bottom or a trough late in the day and in the evening. When we go to sleep, it slowly starts to rise so that it will peak again in the morning. What stress does then is takes those natural patterns, an example of which is on the top, which would be how we respond to a stressful event, which is a rise in cortisol. When we face something stressful, we go up, we peak, and then we come back down again. So there's a natural ebb and flow of hormones and physical responses within our body. However, when we're repeatedly stressed or if we're vulnerable to stress, the bottom two graphs are the ones that are most important to look at. So if I'm stressed and I produce a physical response that goes up, it doesn't come back down. See that long flat line on the top? Now I'm overproducing this hormone that if I produce it in the right amount, it's a good thing for me. If I overproduce it, it's a bad. 
Conversely, just to make it more complicated, if I don't respond at all, that's equally problematic. So the lower right-hand graph is what's called the blunted response. So all those patterns are going on within us physically, and you can basically chart the same things for emotional responses to stress as well. So that's in the background, that stress is affecting us biologically, it's affecting us psychologically. So let's take a look at the next piece in the puzzle that we're concerned with, which are cognitive and executive function skills, your complex thinking skills. So roughly, this is very roughly, we can think of two regions in the brain. One is stuff that's up in the front and on the cortex, on the surface of the brain, on the prefrontal cortex, and that's where those executive functions live. Complex thinking skills, um, our ability to solve problems, our ability to hold complicated information in our head. Down deeper inside the brain, not on the surface and not in the front, is the emotional part of the brain called the limbic system. And there are parts of the brain there that we are essential for our survival and how we respond emotionally to the world around us, to people, and to stressful events. Those two parts of the brain, the executive region and the prefrontal cortex and the emotion region, talk to each other. They're connected by neurons uh, that allow the prefrontal region to kind of quiet down and calm down our emotions. At the same time, the emotion region talks to the cognitive part and tells us when we're in trouble or when something looks scary or threatening. Um, what we know from science uh, is that when we're under stress, certain regions, and I'm not going to go into these in detail, something called your amygdala, your hypothalamus, your, hippoth your hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex are all involved uh, in our responses to stress and our ability to manage stress. And for individuals who are exposed to stress, either chronic or trauma, uh, the emotion regions, the amygdala and the hypothalamus, are activated and the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus are sort of reduced and taken offline. And that's a bad scenario. If the emotion part of your brain is running the show and the thoughtful, uh, complex thinking part of your brain is not running the show, uh, we can get ourselves into some trouble. So what we want to have happening in our brain, and this is based on research that won uh, Eric Kandel, a physician, won him the, the Nobel Prize, uh, was he showed us what happens in our brain uh, in good conditions. And that's that when we learn and remember things, uh, connections in our brain, neurons in our brain that have synapses, the neurons connect to each other, we grow more connections. So when you remember things and when you learn things, there's a change physically in your brain in which you grow more connections and grow more neurons. Conversely, when we're under stress, um, in some parts of the brain, more of that happens, and in important parts of the brain, less of that happens. So what stress does in our prefrontal cortex, that part responsible for cog complex cognitive thinking that we need to manage to solve problems, negotiate the world, regulate our feelings and our emotions, stress actually causes those connections to be reduced. Uh, it disconnects the neurons. So we're less efficient at communicating information and that prefrontal part of our brain is less efficient. The cells don't die, they sort of uh, retract and they pull away and they're less effective. But at the same time, the connections between cells and the emotional part of our brain get stronger under stress. So it's revving up the emotion part and taking offline the part of our brain that we need to kind of control and manage those emotions. So what executive problems show up in HD, which are not just the, the problems due to stress, but due to the disease itself, is difficulty to engage in complex cognitive thinking skills. So it leads to increased emotional responses. Um, this occurs slowly over time as the disease progresses, and those effects are made worse by the chronic stress of the disease. So Huntington's affects the prefrontal parts of our brain and makes our cognitive thinking skills less effective and less efficient. Uh, and at the same time that Huntington's is doing that, uh, stress is doing the same thing. So those parts of our brain responsible for complex thinking are taking that kind of double hit that I was talking about. The importance of that is broad. That affects many parts of our lives, but one specific place that affects us is our ability to cope with and deal with stress. So again, uh, stress is hitting us twice. The stress itself is problematic, and it's also um, tie in our hands in terms of our ability to cope with it. So let's talk about how we cope with stress. Um, the best guideline I can give you for coping with stress turns out that we've done uh, multiple studies for years to prove the serenity prayer. So grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, 
And the most important line in that is the wisdom to know the difference. When should I try to accept things because I can't change them? When should I be trying to change things because I can make certain coping skills that we can have in our toolbox of coping skills are most effective for managing uncontrollable stressors. And another set are gonna be more effective for managing controllable stressors. Next. So we have a disengagement coping. Primary control coping involves efforts to directly act on the source of stress or emotions. Do something about it, change things. Change the situation or try to change directly how you feel. Secondary control coping is, is, involves efforts to adapt to sources of stress. I have to kind of fit in because I can't change things. I don't have the opportunity for control. And the last one, it turns out not to be so hot, is to disengage. So I try to orient away, and I'll give you some examples in the next slide of what those things look like. So primary control coping, best suitable for controllable stress, the perfect example is solving problems, changing situations, gathering information, acting on something that's stressful in your life to make it less stressful. Fix it if you can. For things that you can't fix, one example of that is accepting a problem. I just have to take things the way they are. or thinking about it in a different way, something that psychologists call cognitive reappraisal. That might involve finding meaning in a stressful situation or trying to think about something that's in a way that makes it less difficult. Um, back to those examples I gave you right at the start where someone had said, this has been really difficult for me and my family, but it has brought us closer together. That's a reappraisal. That's focusing on and finding meaning in something that makes it better. Examples of that disenga disengagement coping are avoidance and denial. And although they're the favorite for a lot of us, me included, um, they don't work. They, they take us offline, they pull us away, they interfere with solving problems, they interfere with thinking about things in different ways, uh, so that we might get some short-term relief from avoidance and denial, uh, but they're not long-term solutions to problems, and they never are. So then, how do we link together those complex executive functions and coping? A lot of the problems that we have in complex thinking and executive function then make it hard to cope with stress. One example is something called working memory. So working memory is an example of a complex thinking skill. It's an executive function skill, lives in your prefrontal cortex. Um, an example, if I were to try to test that, is I want to give you something where you have to keep it in your short-term memory and do something with it. So I read you a string of numbers, seven, two, nine, four, five, three, six. And a simple way to do that is tell me those numbers back. Just tell me them in the order I told you. But a working memory task is take those numbers and tell, me to, tell them back to me in the reverse order. So you have to hold them, think about them, and do something with them. And that's a complex cognitive thinking skill that's adversely affected by stress, and it turns out adversely affected by Huntington's disease. Why does it matter in terms of dealing with stress? It matters because one of the key coping skills, cognitive reappraisal, involves thinking about something, keeping it in my mind, and trying to think about it or manipulate it or think about it in a different way. So if I reappraise something in my life, I have to think about it. I can't avoid it, uh, but I also have to change it. If the working memory skills are undermined, then those coping skills are undermined. In addition, though, I mentioned uh, that coping is not a singular thing. I don't do it all by myself. It involves other people in my life. And so we need to look at interpersonal relationships and communication and support from other people. A poem by John Doan, written um, ooh, over 400 years ago, almost 400 years ago, uh, sort of conveys this. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod, a piece of earth, is washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory, a large piece of land, as well as if the manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. We are all interconnected. Uh, we have been hearing for two months now, we are all in this together as we face the COVID-19 pandemic, and John Dunn's poem from 400 years ago still rings true. Uh, we're connected to each other, we support one another, we depend on others for support, and we provide that support to each other. So we're connected in social networks, and here's an example of two social networks, uh, some pink and some blue people, 
And those pink and blue people have people in their lives and some of them are connected to many others and some of them are isolated. So we see somebody in the upper left, a blue person, who's very cut off and isolated from others. There's only one connection for that person. Uh, we see others in the blue and the pink networks that are highly connected to each other. And we also see people who sit at the connection between different social networks. So you could think of the pink network as one family, the blue network as another. And having lots of people in your life and lots of connections is a good thing. Uh, relationships are complicated. Sometimes they're, they lead to conflict and difficulty. Uh, but the person in the upper left who's isolated and alone is at much greater risk for problems of mental health and physical health. So we get sick when we're isolated. In fact, one of the challenges with social distancing has been how to stay emotionally connected to people, even when we're physically disconnected. Because if we're emotionally disconnected, we're in trouble. So a lot of ways to study that. One thing we do in our research is look at communication in families, particularly between parents and their children. Best way to do that is to observe people, record their conversations with each other, and then code the verbal and nonverbal behavior that they display. And from that, we learn how families talk about stress. And in particular, we're learning an enormous amount about how families effectively and ineffectively talk about HD. So how we communicate and how we support each other is crucial. Um, effective communication, particularly one part of it, is looking at parents and how parents work with their kids. Effective parenting is characterized by warmth and structure making sure that your children know that you love them and you care about them, supporting them, providing them an ear to, to come to, to listen to when uh, th they have their troubles and their worries, but also providing structure, clear expectations, uh, providing feedback on things that are good and bad. Being a good parent, an effective parent, providing warmth and structure gets harder when we're under stress, when we're depressed, when we lack resources or we haven't had effective role models. And our task right now is understanding what is it that Huntington's disease does to make it hard to parent. Um, within all that, whether I'm a parent or a child of somebody who has a disease, there's caring for others that comes with costs and benefits. So caring for others is a, a motive in all of us. Uh, altruism, doing things with compassion, caring for others for their sake. Parents care for their children, and children care for their parents, and they care about each other. But there's challenges, uh, and we've seen a cost. We've seen uh, children of parents with cancer. Um, we looked at uh, teenagers who were trying to take care of a mom or dad who was sick with leukemia or some other form of cancer, and it came at a cost. Uh, when you're 15, you're not necessarily prepared to take over the family and take on all those responsibilities, so it's tough. Uh, we've seen children whose parents suffer from depression try to take on those same levels of responsibility. And one that surprised us is we found children with cancer uh, even try to take care of their parents. They feel, uh, they see the pain that their disease has caused their parents and they try to take care of them. And all of those are done with the right reasons and the right motives. They come with some benefits, but they also come with some costs. Um, so to quickly then, the interpersonal consequences of HD for families or it can lead to greater loads of caretaking can lead to a loss of the person who has the disease, what uh, some psychologists want to call an ambiguous loss. That person's still there physically, but that's not the same person that you knew five years ago and 10 years ago. So they're physically present, but the person you know is different. There's a loss of other social relationships. Our worlds start to shrink as Huntington's advances and uh, cripples us in certain ways and limits us. There's the pain of seeing somebody that we love decline. Uh, and for those who are the offspring, the children of parents with uh, Huntington's, the worry that they'll go through that same process that they're seeing. Um, so it's some themes just quickly from adolescents whose parents suffer from this watching and waiting. So I'm sort of in the shadow of HD, waiting in that shadow, knowing that I'm at risk and not sure what the future holds to me. Um, and being alone in the midst of others. So feeling isolated. Um, although there are people around me, I don't feel emotionally connected. That person who said earlier on, there's just no one here for me in my family that I can talk to. So interpersonal relationships and communication are crucial for our health and our, our emotional well-being, and those things can get disrupted pretty profoundly in Huntington's. Family life is hard, having to be like an adult as a child, so continuing those same kinds of themes. So how can we help? What is it that we're doing in our work at Vanderbilt University and in Nashville in collaboration with Dr. Claussen uh, that we can move forward with this? So we're developing new programs and we're in the early stages to try to do our best to help families facing Huntington's disease. 
Um, we think we've got a few options in front of us. One is how to improve cognitive function. So I've said several times, executive functions are important for us in many ways, including how we manage stress. And there are things we can do to sustain, maintain, uh, and improve our executive function. There are computer-based programs. Uh, some people call them cognitive training programs. Some call them mental fitness programs. But using your brain and practicing your brain as if almost as if it's a muscle can have some effects. Uh, it's pretty limited to the things you practice on the computer, but you can build your working memory skills, which I had talked about before, and problem-solving skills by practicing them. And then a surprising one, aerobic exercise has a beneficial effect on brain function. It builds those connections in the brains, in your brain. And it's interesting that we're not quite sure of why that happens, but aerobic exercise and using your brain to solve co complex kinds of problems are both things that are beneficial. In addition, we've developed programs to enhance parenting, coping skills, communication skills. We help parents be better parents. Uh, we help children how to cope. So the cognitive training piece I mentioned, you can do this as an online kind of training. There's a company called Lumosity, a company called CogMed. Uh, you spend time at the computer. They try to jazz them up and make them as much like games as possible. There are some benefits, not, not pervasive, but there are some focused benefits of those. Uh, and then the, um, the notion of teaching parenting skills and coping skills, my apologies for a typo on this slide that just caught my eye, and our work with parents with a history of depression. Um, if a family has a history of depression, a mom or dad has depression, and you're a child in that family, your risk for depression jumps up about four to five times greater than if that wasn't a part of your family. It creates stress in family environments, stress that's recurrent, chronic, unpredictable, uncontrollable. And the best way to adapt to that is using acceptance, reappraisal, and sometimes distraction. So we took that information, uh, developed a program for families where a mom or dad has depression uh, to build more effective parenting, warmth, praise, spending quality time together, listening attentively, validating your children, um, and then structure clear ex expectations for your child and consequences, and managing your own emotions first and then attending to those of others. So we do that in our program for families with depression. Next slide. Uh, we also teach coping skills to the kids, how to use coping skills to adapt. And what we found through a program is um, when families either received our program or received another kind of information-based program but didn't build those skills, um, for those who went through the information-only condition in our study, over a two-year period, almost 27% of children in those families had an episode of depression within those two years, compared with 13% of kids who went through our family-based program, helping children learn ways to cope, adolescents really learn how to cope, and parents learn those parenting skills. And that's provided a model for us when we think about how to begin to work and um, begin to support families with Huntington's disease, is how do we help parents who have Huntington's disease, how do we help their partners uh, to parent in those families, and how do we help adolescents, young adults, children learn the skills to be able to cope with the stress of Huntington's. So as we translate then, we want to look at how to uh, identify exposure to chronic stress and adversity in families with Huntington's disease, how to identify ways to build resilience and ways to enhance it, and that's going to involve a host of different interventions, we think, over the, the next year or two. So uh, we've begun this effort, and we're, our first step is meeting with families, learning from families, from the resilient families, from the vulnerable families, uh, to translate that. So my, my last thought that I want to share with you is that um, many times people who do research do research to describe problems and understand problems, and then, to be honest, they walk away. Uh, and we're in this to learn about, understand, and describe the adversities and stresses for families with Huntington's disease, but we're not gonna walk away. Our goal is to then develop programs uh, that we can first test at Vanderbilt and then disseminate out to the Huntington's community uh, in our effort to follow through on what I said is a compelling thing for us, the, our commitment to making the lives of families with Huntington's disease at least a little bit better. That was Dr. Ruth Humpfeth, um, Professor of Pediatrics at Vanderbilt. Um, unfortunately, again, he was unable to join us today, but thank you very much to HD for allowing us to share that video. Um, some wonderful information there. Um, 
that wraps up our session for today. Thank you so much uh, to Teva for sponsoring our symposium. Um, it would not have been possible without them. So thank you, Teva. Um, and this presentation has been recorded. And again, it will be made available on the CU Movement website, cumovement.org, and on the Movement Disorders Foundation website, which is movementdisordersfoundation.org. Um, we hope you all found some valuable information and um, we look forward to seeing you again, again in person one day. Thank you.